Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. I am Dr. Megan Wong from Essex Law School, University of Essex, where I am a lecturer in law and the founding director of the LLM in International Law um, degree. It is with profound pleasure for me to open our event today and to welcome you to the launch of this um, International Environmental Law Text Cases and Materials book published with Edward Elgar together with my co-authors, Professor Magosha Fitzmorris and Dr. Joseph Krampin. I am also honored and delighted that our discussants for today's event, Judge Maria Teresa Fonticafi, Dr. Nilofer Aral, and Professor Attila Tanzi will be joining us for a conversation about our book and international environmental law. It is also great to see our editorial team from Edward Elgar in the audience. So, hi everyone. Um, my role today is your host and moderator for this book launch. And I will begin by introducing, we'll commence our conversation with our discussants. We will begin our conversation with um, Dr. Nolo for Oral, followed by Judge Maria Teresa Fonticafi, and then Professor Attila Tanzi. So each of our um, discussants will speak for about um, 10 minutes. And then this will be followed by my co author, Dr. Joseph Crampin, who will respond to the respective um comments by our discussants dr krampin will speak for 10 minutes and then our other co-author professor malgosha fitzmorris will make the concluding remarks and an ending note about the direction in which international environment law is moving towards in other words what to read about in the second edition of our book we'll then open the audience for q a and you may enter your questions into the box and just a quick note i will read out your name and affiliations unless you opt to be anonymous. So now I'm delighted to introduce my co-authors, um, Professor Malgosha Fitzmaurice and Dr. Joseph Krampin, and perhaps a little bit more of a personal note that, of course, um, you know, writing scholarship and contributing to the field of public international law is always a pleasure, but to co-author a book together with close friends is even more meaningful and of course, further excuses for cake and coffee, but perhaps I could just take the moment to thank my co-authors for, for writing this book with me. I'm really so happy that we could write this book um, together. And now for the introductions, um, Professor Malgosha Fitzmaurice holds a chair of public international law at the Department of Law, Queen Mary University of London. She is an associate member of the Institut de Droit International She's a generalist public international lawyer, and of course, Malgosha Fitzmaurice is synonymous with the law of treaties as well as international environmental law. And our other co-author, Dr. Joseph Prampin, is a lecturer in international law at the School of Law, University of Glasgow. Dr. Krampin is a generalist public international lawyer who recently completed his PhD on good faith in international dispute settlement at University College London. And now before I speak about the book, I would like to make a few acknowledgements on behalf of my co-authors, Malgosha and Joseph. We would like to first acknowledge our research assistant, Dr. Nicolo Lanzoni for his invaluable work on the chapters in our book on permanent sovereignty over natural resources and management of hazardous waste. We would like to thank the editorial team at Edward Elgar for working with us on this book from proposal to print. We would also like to thank our endorsers for this book, Judge Maria Teresa Fanticafi, Dr. Nilofer Aro, Professor Philippe Sands, and Professor Sean Murphy for engaging with our work and providing their generous endorsements. Um, and last but not least, we have received many comments about this beautiful artwork on the cover, which is by a Latvian artist, Leonitz Arendt. And this artwork is called Childhood Pasture Day. And I thought that it goes um, very much to the heart of our book and the importance of international law addressing environmental challenges and global concerns as the environment is a precondition for the enjoyment of our world and for Childhood Pasture Day of children today, as well as 
generations to come. So we would like to thank um, Judge Yanis Pleps and Professor Martins Paparinskis for helping us to get the copyright from the Tukums Museum of Art and to Monica Berzina for the permission to use her father's artwork. And now um, I would just like to make three points about our book. First, this book in, on international environmental law is written from a generalist public international law analytical framework. Second, I will speak briefly about the aim of the book. And third, I will speak briefly about the content and structure of this book. So to my first point that this book is written from a generalist public international law analytical framework, the starting point is that all three co-authors are generalist public international lawyers with a specialist interest in international environmental law. It is from this analytical premise that we engage with the content of the book. Now, I will speak more about the structure and content of the book in my third point, but at present, I want to just highlight quickly three generalist themes that cut across all the chapters in our book and I believe our discussion later today. First, the making of international environmental law. Second, multilateral environmental agreements as very sophisticated treaties. And third, multilateralism in today's international legal order. How international environmental law is made falls very much within the generalist public international law nomenclature as the international legal framework comprises a multitude of multilateral environmental agreements, many of which are framework conventions, as well as an extensive array of soft law. Indeed, international environmental law is one of the specialist subfields of international law in which states engage in informal lawmaking processes and soft law plays a large role in the vocabulary of states in both formal and informal settings. Um, as we know, multilateral environmental agreements are in themselves very sophisticated treaties with very sophisticated treaty bodies and non-compliance procedures. I'm sure that many a diplomat, legal advisor, treaties division would attest that multilateral environmental agreements are not exactly the easiest treaties to negotiate. And of course, at the heart of every treaty is that states must perform their treaty obligations in good faith. And this brings us to the issue of implementation and compliance of international environmental obligations, as well as what happens in the event of non-compliance or breach of international environmental obligations. And here we situate the discussion firmly within the generalist public international law um, nomenclature of peaceful settlement of disputes, as well as the perhaps more niche prevention of a dispute, so to speak, with non-compliance procedures within multilateral environmental agreements. And additionally, the book features cutting edge issues of international environmental law, which go to the heart of multilateralism and in public international law, the human right to a healthy environment, climate change, atmospheric protection, biodiversity, marine biodiversity, the protection of the marine environment and the law of international watercourses. These are issues of global and regional concern and to which multilateralism provides the international institutional law framing for states to address these issues. So these are the generalist themes that cut across our book and which will be featured in our discussion um, today. Now I move on to my second point, which is the aim of this book. So the aim of this book is to provide a comprehensive source to a broad range of legal instruments and case law relevant to the protection and regulation of the environment. What we hope is to provide our readership with a broad understanding of the existing legal frameworks presented in a manner which is accessible and easy to use. And of course, it goes without saying that we have selected to um, what we have selected to include in this book is not meant to, nor could it replace the need to examine the primary materials in their entirety. Um, also, the selection of the material, while comprehensive, is obviously not exhaustive. And as um, my co-author, Professor Fitzmaurice, was saying in her concluding remarks, international environmental law whilst robust and resilient is also dynamic and evolving. And thus areas of development that are currently the subjects of negotiations, 
or works in progress within formal or informal lawmaking settings are only lightly touched upon because it is not within the ambit of the book or our scholarship to predict or speculate on the final um, outcome. And now we come to the third point and my final point about um, my introduction to this book, the content and structure of this book. So the book is divided into four parts. Part one examines the main principles of international environmental law. So this encompasses sustainable development, permanent sovereignty over natural resources, the prevention of transboundary harm, precautionary principle, polluter pays principle, intergenerational equity, and environmental impact assessment. And then in part two, we examine the more, um, the more substantive aspects of environmental regulation, including the protection of the marine environment, conservation of marine living resources, biodiversity and marine biodiversity, which will be touched upon in our discussion today, um, as well as international water courses, the management of hazardous waste, atmosphere protection and climate change. And then part three covers the implementation and enforcement of international environmental law including responsibility and liability for environmental damage, non-compliance procedures, and the settlement of environmental disputes, which um, Judge Maria Teresa Infanticafi and Professor Attila Tanzi will touch upon in their comments. And in part four, our book addresses the relationship between environmental law and other specialist subfields of public international law, in particular trade and the environment, and the environment and armed conflict. So now that I have introduced the book and provided a little bit of a mini overview, we can um, commence our discussion. And I'm very pleased to introduce our very respect, uh, very impressive speakers who in their respective capacities play a role in formal and informal settings of the making of international law and perhaps um you know because we're talking about beautiful art if i could just go back to my earlier remarks about um the beautiful cover art and how the environment is a precondition to the enjoyment of our world then you know perhaps um let me thank each of you for playing such a significant role in helping to preserve the children pasture day for today's children and future generations to come um, and now I would like to introduce Judge Maria Teresa Infanticafi, who is a judge of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. She is a member of the Institut de Droit International and has held several positions, including professor at the University of Chile and at the Diplomatic Academy of Chile. She has acted as co-agent of Chile in disputes before the International Court of Justice, including the Maritime Dispute, obligation to negotiate and the status and use of the waters of the Silala. She was also ambassador of Chile to the Kingdom of the Netherlands and the permanent representative to the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. Um, and it's now a pleasure to introduce Dr. Nilifer Arl. Dr. Arl is director of the Center of International at the National, um, National University of Singapore and the co-director of the Center of International Law E Academy of International Law. She is a member of the UN International Law Commission and also the co-chair of the study group on sea level rise in relation to international law and is responsible for the topic of the law of the sea. She was also second vice chair in the International Law Commission in 2019 and has advised the Turkish foreign minister in the law of the sea and was a climate change negotiator for the Turkish foreign ministry. Um, she's a member of the Legal Expert Committee of the Commission on Climate Change for Small Island States and has also appeared before the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. And now I introduce Professor Attila Tanzi, who holds the Chair of International Law at the University of Bologna, and he's an associate member of three Phoebe Chambers. Professor Tanzi is a generalist public international lawyer with interests in um, international procedural law, international environmental law, international investment law, and international law of the sea. His appointments include being a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, conciliator, 
at the OSC Court of Conciliation and Arbitration, and he is the chair of the Implementation Committee of the 1992 UNEC Convention on the Protection and Use of Transboundary Watercourses and International Lakes. And his practice includes being counsel in interstate litigation, as well as arbitrator in investor state disputes. So our very impressive speakers and um, now over to our discussants and Dr. Nolifer Oral, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Megan. And I'm truly honored uh, to be part of this very distinguished panel for the book launch. Yes, and I have my book here, <laughs> a beautiful book, not only externally, but substantively as well. Um, so today I have the great honor and privilege to speak about um, protection of the marine environment. And I have to first start by congratulating the co-authors, uh, professors Ossie Fitzmaurice, Wong and Krumpen for this excellent textbook on international environmental law. And I know it will be used by many professors uh, in their teaching of the next generation of international environmental law scholars, such an important topic. And today I'm gonna to speak specifically on protection of the marine environment, which is found in chapter 10 of the book. And like you, Megan, I'm going to take a generalist uh, perspective, um, so not to take too much time. Um, but I have to say that the, the chapter is excellent. It provides a very well-structured, clear overview of the key components on protection of the marine environment. And considering that 70% of the planet is ocean, this is definitely important. And I completely agree with the opening paragraph that says, quote, the Earth's oceans are of great significance for human beings and the planet. They're essential to the carriage of goods, provide numerous natural resources, sustain large ecosystems. But however, uh, there's serious amount of harm done to the oceans uh, and is having deleterious consequences. Um, so the starting point is the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention and uh, chapter 10 starts with that. And in particular, part 12 on protection and preservation um, of the environment. And um, 2022, we celebrated the 40th anniversary, but 40 years later, part 12 still remains a remarkable chapter, a remarkable contribution um, to the protection of the marine environment. To be quite honest, we still don't have anything that is quite as extensive and comprehensive even though it is a framework, uh, provides a framework. And we also have to keep in mind that the Law of the Sea Convention, including, of course, Chapter 12 on Protection and Preservation of the Marine Environment, was negotiated between 1973 and 1982, the year it was adopted. This is a decade before the landmark and critical uh, point of uh, the 1992 Rio Conference, the Declaration, the Principles, Convention on Biological Diversity, Climate Change, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, and key principles that emerged afterwards, such as precaution. So the convention predated all of that. Um, also, this was before concepts really developed, such as area-based management tools, marine protected areas, those are practices and measures that really developed towards the end of the 20th century and in the 21st century. So um, nonetheless, the Law of the Sea Convention really still remains an extremely relevant and important convention for uh, providing us that vital framework. And we know that because in the 40th anniversary, there were so many celebrations. And I think that really does show that the convention is alive and is fit for purpose. Uh, the UK uh, government had a very important um, uh, study of this, bringing in lots of experts. So um, uh, the convention provides a general framework, part 12, but what's really important always I highlight is article 192. And it's simple, it's elegant, and it's very clear, the obligation, an undiluted obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment. States have to protect and preserve the marine environment. There's no qualification in that. And this is understood to mean a due diligence obligation, which we know from the Paul Mills judgment is an obligation that entails not only the adoption of appropriate rules and measures, but also a certain level of vigilance in their enforcement by states. 
Um, and, and so um, another important uh, provision, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but is Article 194. It's quite detailed actually. But again, here we have very clear obligations that all states are under an obligation to take all measures to prevent, reduce, and control the pollution of the marine environment from any source. Um, and while it seems to be focused on pollution, it actually goes beyond that because in paragraph five, it specifically mentions the duty of protection to include those necessary to protect and preserve rare or fragile ecosystems, such as the habitat of depleted, threatened, and endangered species and other forms of marine life. And today, that could not be more relevant as we know what's happening with ecosystems, coral reefs, um, that are really um, under uh, threat of extinction, frankly. Um, so what is also very important about uh, part 12, it really has a very broad net. There, again, there's no other convention or instrument of this kind that addresses all activities from activities for seabed, dumping, vessel source pollution, atmospheric pollution, which is important when we now think of climate change. Um, and um, uh, pollution um, uh, relating to all sources. Another important part of the convention is that it provides for extensive duties of cooperation um, and particularly at the global and regional levels. Um, related, it's in a different section, but we also have another article on enclosed and semi-enclosed seas, article 123. Um, and this is where there's uh, states are to cooperate um, in taking uh, measures um, such as for protection of the marine environment, and that includes regional seas such as the Mediterranean. And I have to say that one area that um, perhaps wasn't quite as detailed, of course it is, would fall under the Article 192 obligation, is protection preservation of the high seas. Um, so that is considered, considered to have been a gap, particularly since a lot of the measures and um, such as marine protected areas developed after uh, the negotiation adoption of the convention. But now the latter is being addressed. Uh, we have an ongoing negotiations uh, going on uh, five IGC five. Uh, the second part will be in New York, uh, in, I think in February and March. And they're, they're negotiating an internationally legally binding instrument for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. So we see that you know, the Law of the Sea Convention is a living instrument and it continues to be uh, supplemented and, and states are cooperating as they are mandated to under the convention itself. Well, however, we still have some gaps and one of these is climate change. Um, we, so climate change was not an issue when the convention was adopted. Um, but it has since become a big issue. And frankly, the last 10 years, we've really seen the growing impacts on the ocean, ocean warming, ocean acidification, sea level rise. So the, the, um, the, the convention doesn't directly address this. What is interesting, of course, we know that um, we have a advisory opinions uh, in the pipeline. One of them has been brought by the Commission of Small Island States on Climate Change. Uh, request to, to the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, and hopefully that will offer some clarification of the obligation of states in relation to the marine environment. So I think I will stop here, just say that um, there's also the regional instruments, um, but I'm gonna stop because uh, I could go on and on, but I don't want to take time from the other speakers. And I just want to again, thank you for inviting me for the launching of this very, um, I think it's gonna be a very popular and very useful textbook. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Nellifer. Um, Maria Teresa. Um, yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Marigosia, and, and dear Joseph. Uh, it is a great pleasure to uh, be part of this panel, uh, speaking uh, uh, with regard to a book that would be not only be so useful to scholars, uh, to practitioners, 
but also uh, where you deploy a very fine awareness for teaching and research. I think this is a very uh, unique feature of this book. It gives uh, us an essential element uh, that we have to learn about sources and regimes in the environmental law scenario. But there is also more than this. From the outset, I would like to say that the introduction to general principles and approaches hints at the subtleties with which you authors manage your subjects. How much can domestic law and case law assist us in refining our views of the matters you are depicting? Reviewing the pages of the book is a positive exercise to elucidate these questions. Recent resolutions uh, of the uh, international organizations or international conferences have added supplementary perspectives to the already complex relationship between human beings and the environment. This book is then a contribution to the renovation of teaching and research methodologies in the field of the environment. As an aftermath of this work, some of us will be tempted to request more to go further and to see some other comparative dimensions. I must acknowledge the seriousness and consistency of the treatment of the selected subjects which are present in this text. So my comments will address some issues which appear as ancillary to the effectiveness of the norms composing the substantive law that is covered by the book. In this respect, I would like to speak about the potentials of compliance enforcement in respect of the instruments that are depicted in the book. I employ the term of compliance in an eclectic way uh, by considering the theoretical elements introduced by different authors to analyze the influence of international law over states and non-state actors. At the same time, one characteristic suggested by the substantive law as depicted in the book is the idea that in the implementation process of the selected provisions, different actors and agents are in search of coherence between the principles, means, and specific rules. Coherence, which is also governed by the good faith principle, which is also an essential part of our international law concept. On the other hand, the notions of compliance and enforcement are conceived as structural features of the substantive norms, which in the environmental legal ambience are also closely related to the scientific knowledge, to economic, or economic uh, relations axioma, and prevailing, prevailing legal frameworks. In this sense, the book introduces us through an empirical, conceptual, and normative research, quite able to provide answers to the classical question of how nations behave, as said that by famous Professor Henkin. In a, if in a decentralized order compliance mechanisms are there, are those provided by the international conventions based on the consent theory, as well as by the national legal order of each and every state, the normative sources of environmental law, as it is well depicted in the book, will be assessed as closely intertwined with the capacities envisioned in the international instruments and with an effective implementation in the domestic sphere. It not only means the incorporation of international norms and rules in the domestic legal system, according to its own procedures, but also the possibility that those norms and rules influence public policies and legislative developments, and that they penetrate institutions in a way that empowers them with tools to enforce and control the agreed norms. Dispute settlement procedures will also appear in this scenario. The book certainly confirms that compliance is also a matter of internalization of internal legal rules, international legal rules by the domestic legal systems together with a matter of fairness and what has been classified as a managerial setup. A leading author and practitioner who wrote about why do nations obey international law refers to this phenomenon of endowing the internal legal order with the duty to render international law enforceable. The section on the, on the protection and preservation of the marine environment and its conventional underpinnings 
provides very substantive elements to reflect on the power of international law to interact not only with technical matters, but also to frame the process of creation of international law. In the case of the legally binding instruments, which are presented in the instructional manner by the book according to the nature of the object of protection and the resulting obligations, most of them may be characterized as sources of authentic regimes enjoying considerable stability and effectiveness. The book is also a source of analysis about interactions between conventions and the transnational legal process. We know that the binding set of norms and principles is always accompanied by political commitments and social beliefs. The relevance of this interconnection is not a minor one. The one then one feature of the book that is also worth highlighting is the inclusion of each in each section of references to uh, soft law and the uh, importance in the impact of soft law in the creation of hard law and the development of new norms. This feature is further supported by the inclusion of case law, which brings a third actor into the operation of interpretation and compliance, tribunals, commissions, and other bodies. The way the sections are construed play a pedagogical goal that invites us to understand better where and to what extent international law is deploying its strengths and goals. Then another question. Do the substantive law and enforcement regulations depicted in the book in chapter two admit different forms of compliance in the sense that their norms and rules could be applied in ways that include different forms of control, which overtake the natural inclination of they to introduce reciprocity as a normal mechanism of mutual oversight. It is therefore correct to look at the nature and scope of the norms presented in the book, so, uh, the seven sections of part two, that includes, among others, the protection of the marine environment, conservation of marine resources, and many other areas that have been uh, enumerated and highlighted by Nilo Ferry and Ben in your introduction, Megan. As the book reflects, the law of the sea is a suitable area to test the validity of the approach. There the impact on bilateral and regional ambits and the possibility of recourse to dispute settlement procedures are part of the equation. And the issue of the prevention of pollution that has been among the historical antecedents of, of the legal and political developments uh, in this respect indicate that international law operates in a highly technical environment and that preparedness and response by states cannot be taken in isolation from policies and rules that bring real meanings, meanings to, the international, to international cooperation. Let us remind that this chapter and other sources, as Nilufer highlighted, will be at the heart of the opinion that ITLOS will have to render in the near future pursuant to requests made by international organizations concerning sea level rise and the law of the sea. On marine living resources, the implications of the existence of sovereign rights uh, uh, of states to deal with those resources in the economic zone, together with a close interrelation that may exist between those resources with transboundary resources in the high seas also pose particular compliance issues. In this respect, the role of responsibilities of flag states, port states, and coastal states contained in chapter two cannot be overlooked. On the contrary, this is another area where the influence of soft law has been critical to induce developments in the hard law. Hazardous, uh, hazardous wastes show another feature of these compliance questions. Among those, the induction to compliance through either non-compulsory means or in association with trade, investments, and management as tools to make more effective the prevention of uh, the risks of these materials and their treatment. This is a highly technical subject which needs to be analyzed by states and non-state actors in a way that overcome the fra fragmented components of the regime. The corresponding section of the book highlights that there are various sources that envision the problem of management of hazardous wastes that may be uh, working 
one beside the other. Uh, this, uh, as it appears from the reading of the, uh, the instruments, several instruments, reporting systems are crucial to disclose the underlying factors present in the exchanges and activities covered by these instruments and that together amount to an international regime, as I have said. It means that the information offered by states may shed light on the density of the connection between the state and its international obligations. This is more frequent even in some disarmament settings, such as the Chemical Weapons Convention, which is a, a, a very, a very close to the certain regimes you have depicted in the book. Also, more advanced compliance procedures may become part of a regulatory set of rules, as it is with fact-finding methods and the reporting on regulatory actions that states may take to abide by international obligations. It is not to be neglected also the, the impact of regional agreements, where specific sensitivities uh, of member states are reflected. I must admit that the reading of the sections in part two illustrates how much international law has evolved in terms of introducing active contacts to prevent, reduce, and control, or even to eliminate the consequences of certain actions. Tools such as trade and the weight attributed to human rights regimes to deal with environmental issues affecting or potentially affecting human rights are adding more substance to uh, this key chapter. A singular feature is the one related to the atmospheric protection, where the work of the International Law Commission, Commission illustrate about the understanding that there is still much to develop in this area. Advancements such as low range, range pollution and the ozone layer protection show that there are possibilities to create either technical obligations or financial mechanisms to induce better practice. The book tells us then uh, something which is very important to recall. It is that despite the alleged frag fragmentation, there are strong common patterns in the way that international law is operating uh, in this respect. The introduction of notions of an environmental sound management and the method of prior informed consent which leads to the direct involvement of different actors, public and private ones, are very important. So the, the conventions introduce more elements for control and prevention, such as the Minamata uh, Convention and the convention devoted to persistent organic pollutant. Uh, of course, I cannot omit what climate change has brought in terms of compliance mechanisms due to the nature of the threat and the gradual implications for the common uh, goods uh, uh, that we want to protect. Like in other regime settings, the identification of interest, interests at stake, whether general or specific, have proved to be highly relevant to discuss the ability of the compliant, compliance processes and the success or gaps in the disciplines, including precautionary measures. Let us remind that uh, on compliance, one assumption is that states are rational and they pursue their own self-interest. And I don't forget this in the interpretation of the practice of states. Authors admit that methods to ensure compliance may be composed of complex mechanisms, an array of measures at the national and international levels. Formal and informal exchanges also take place. A combination of preventive and repressive forms of inducing compliance are much present in our current international relations. And the book tells us that international law is active in delineating legal and technical systems to induce preventive measures, as well as changes in the conduction of business and regulated activities. Uh, the consequence of non-compliance will also be discussed in this panel. I would like to finish by saying that in our current international system, states are not only supposed to supply responses and to adopt coordinating measures, but also to anticipate the way to enhance the already established cooperation schemes. These responses and measures entail economic and political compromise, an introduction of the evolving scientific knowledge considering 
also technical advancements. I'm conscious that there are legitimacy issues involved in the, in the rule making processes on the matter and that coherence in the structures of existing rules are central to deal with the threats that lie at the heart of international environmental law. Solutions do not operate in isolation, and although there may be problems uh, arising from the structure of our current international system, part two of the book also teaches that there are primary and secondary rules already enjoying a place in international law, and that have been created either by the conventions and even customary law, or through binding agreements validly adopted in conference of state parties, which is a, a dimension I have not dealt with in my introduction. With this, I conclude my remarks while thanking very much the authors of the opportunity to enjoy this remarkable occasion. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Teresa, for your um, kind words about our book and for your um, intervention. Attila? Very, I'm going to hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And now we can see you too. All right. Thank you so much. And sorry. Um, well, thank you very much for the invitation to, to, to share views about this, this very useful book. Uh, if, as I say, if one likes what he knows, and if this holds true, I should have now come to like this book very, very much. I first perused it with a certain greediness of information when deciding to adopt it for my international environmental law course this year. Then I reverted to it when I had to put together the syllabus and now, of course, for today's discussion. I believe that the added value of this book, as, as I say, it, it, it is well expressed in its subtitle. This is not a book of cases as, and materials, as you have many, with all the credits to be given to cases and materials books around. But this is a textbook with cases and materials. I found the text introducing and accompanying the select cases and materials in each chapter. They are illustrative, they are succinct, but they are deep and dense at the same time. And they are uniform throughout the book, despite the composition of the editors. Uh, so congratulations on that. Uh, and you can see these features in the introduction. In a rather magical way, in 14 pages, you have managed to provide a bird's eye view, but in very high definition. The historical development of international environmental law and its sources are represented faithfully drawing from the contemporary discourse on the sources of international law generally, as you um, indicated in your introduction today. And, and that includes a reference to the ongoing work of the International Law Commission workings on general principles. And I've noted the intellectual honesty with which the authors admit to the difficulty in determining, and I quote, the legal effects of principles in environmental law, unquote. Here one would subscribe entirely to the breaking down of general principles in international environmental law to their multifarious configurations, namely from the circumstance when a given general principle represents a source of rights and duties when evidentiary of a customary rule, to the circumstance when this is not the case, but where general principles, and I quote again from page 12, provide coherence to the interpretation of environmental norms contained in treaties or customary law, unquote. When it comes to the choice of the selected topics, the book seems to me extremely well-structured and balanced between comprehensiveness and prioritization. On this core, looking at part four on international environmental law and international law generally, one may be initially surprised not to see international environmental law and human rights. But upon a second reading, one finds this topic coherently addressed in part one on general principles and approaches under the rubric, the human right to a healthy environment. And as I see it, this seems to follow the right structural approach 
since nowadays we are no longer confronted with two separate bodies of public international law, but with two increasingly integrated areas of the law where either is part and parcel of the other. What I noticed in my research and practice with a sense of pleasant surprise was that the environmental diplomacy world and the human rights one have worked for long decades on separate tracks, but unwittingly converging into a common terminus. Came to realize this when involved in the UNEC process, which produced the 1999 London Protocol on Water and Health. And it is no accident that this protocol features as the first piece of instrument selected by you in the chapter on the human right to a healthy environment. And one should not forget that more than 20 years back from now, the integration between the two bodies of international law and point was far from obvious. Still on the overall structure, perhaps in view of the second edition, the authors may consider adding a separate chapter on the protection of environment and international investment law. Even if in the present edition, chapter three on permanent sovereignty of natural resources addresses aspects of this issue. Coming to the chapter on the law of international water courses, I can say how much I enjoyed reading it for much the same features I've already indicated for the book more generally. The introductory language is succinct, but takes the reader through the key conceptual and lawmaking milestones of the international water law process. It elicits the reader's special interest in the topic from the outset by taking it from Agenda 21, Chapter 18, showing water as an indispensable part of all terrestrial ecosystems and thus fundamental to human survival. Fact is that the majority of freshwater resources, both surface and groundwater, cross borders. And that accounts for the importance of the international regulation of transboundary waters. The recapitulating of the four theoretical pillars that have grounded the evolution of the body of international water law, absolute territorial sovereignty, absolute territorial integrity, limited territorial sovereignty, and the community of interests. There is spelled out in very clear terms, and it seems important to note from the trajectory of the evolution of international water law since its inception, that the limited territorial sovereignty doctrine, or practice if you wish, is the key normative catalyst, and that parallels the overall public international law process as one consisting of customary and conventional forms of acceptance by states, obviously for a reasonable purpose, of legal constraints on their originally absolute sovereignty claims. In international water law, this is epitomized by the conclusion of the 1906 convention between the United States and Mexico on the equitable distribution of the waters of the Rio Grande putting an end to a long and acrimonious dispute nourished by claims of absolute territorial sovereignty clashing against opposite absolute territorial integrity claims. The additional value introduced in the international water law process by the overall prevailing rational state practice and opinion juries is the awareness of the community of interests of all core parents in the transboundary water course from a river basin perspective. And this appears clearly in your accompanying text, as well as in the choice of the documents that you have selected for the chapter. Now, while this community of interest had a merely economic relevance in the past for navigational or hydropower purposes, it now has a wider scope namely the environmental sustainability of the transboundary waters in question. And Article 5 of the New York Convention on Equitable and Reasonable Utilization, which you have reproduced in the book, accounts for the shift from equitable utilization period to equitable utilization and participation and equitable utilization not just aimed at optimal economic 
maximization, but at optimization and sustainability of the use of transboundary water courses. The introduction of the sources of international water law is again comprehensive in the book, as it acknowledges the harmoniously complementary codification function of the two now global conventions in the field, the 1992 UNEC convention and the 1997 New York convention. The former, the UNECE convention, is characterized by detailed standards and most importantly by a robust institutional process of assistance to its parties and often also to non-parties revolving around the meeting of the parties and its subsidiary organs, including the implementation committee, which performs the compliance, uh, observance, monitoring, and promotion function of which already Maria Teresa has provided introductory considerations and stimulating insights. The New York Convention can be said to be a most authoritative general statement of the lowest common denominator of international customer law in the field. And it was telling that four months after its adoption, in September 1997, years before it would enter into force, the International Court of Justice in Gabchikovo has referred to it as evidentiary of customary law with regard to the equitable and reasonable utilization principle. The introduction to chapter 13 in the book most appropriately emphasizes the importance of groundwater which accounts for 97% of the available fresh water on the planet. In fact, the New York Convention, as acknowledged by one of its founding fathers, Professor Steve McCaffrey, applies to surface water and groundwater alike. However, in the pursuit of perfection, which as they say and I subscribe to is often the enemy of the good, the ILC has engaged in the elaboration of separate rules on transboundary aquifers, which led to the adoption of a set of draft articles on the topic in 2008. Stressed by Professor McCaffrey on the American Journal of International Law, this effort does not necessarily help clarifying the hydrological scope of application of international water law to confined groundwaters, as if the latter were subject to a different body of law where the territorial sovereignty principle would enjoy a higher relevance than under international water law proper. Were this to be the case, which many don't believe, myself included, the 2008 draft articles would not necessarily facilitate dispute prevention and settlement of the transboundary aquifers, as states would be encouraged to cling on to territorial sovereignty claims, are they? could be grounded under draft article three, which you find reproduced on page 306 of the book. In line with the New York Convention, UNEC Convention applies to transboundary surface water and to both related and unrelated groundwater alike. Worth noting are two supplementary UNEC soft law instruments in the field. First, the UNEC guidelines on monitoring and assessment of transboundary groundwaters adopted at the Hague meeting of the parties in 2000. It addresses multiple characterizations of transboundary aquifer systems without distinction between related and unrelated groundwater. Second, the model provisions on transboundary groundwaters prepared by the legal board and the core group on groundwater of the Helsinki Water Convention and adopted in 2012 in Rome. Uh, maybe in the second edition, the authors may consider adding at least the model provisions on terms of boundary groundwaters. They aim at increasing water diplomats and lawmakers in their awareness of the strategic importance of transboundary groundwater and promote the application to them of international water law. To that end, the model provisions are meant to provide guidance in the identification of groundwater and in drafting or reviewing bilateral 
multilateral agreements on transboundary groundwaters. One last remark. The careful consideration given by the authors to the lawmaking process methodology and the due acknowledgement given to the non-governmental codification with regard to the ILA rules in the field of international water law. In fact, the 1966 Helsinki ILA rules have been the basic building block around which the ILC produced the background work, which led to the New York Convention. And most appropriately, the introduction to chapter 13 accounts for the fact that the Helsinki rules from 1966 have been replaced by the 2004 ILA Berlin rules on water resources. And I know for one that international water diplomats and lawyers very much rely for interpretative purposes also to the ILA Berlin rules. I suppose my time is up. I stop there and I look forward to taking part in the in the debate after the reaction from the authors, which I congratulate very much once again for their efforts. Thank you so much, Atala. And I, I believe I speak on behalf of me and Joseph and Melgosha to say we're so happy you adopted this for your course at the University of Bologna. So thank you. Um, thank you for that. And now, uh, Joseph, if you want to just respond to um, our panel of discussants. Um, thank you, Meg. And um, I want to, uh, to thank my co-authors, um, Meg and Malgoja, and also to reiterate um, the words of thanks uh, that, that Meg gave at the beginning um, in respect to the EE and um, also to the, uh, to the artist and the artist family in respect of the um, in respect to the cover and the various other uh, words of thanks that, uh, that Meg gave. Um, I also want to thank in particular um, our speakers today, Nilifa, Maria Teresa and Attila, um, for their kind words about the book and for um, what I think um, everyone watching would agree is the extremely insightful and informative comments um, about um, the various areas of international environmental law that they addressed and um, uh, the relation between uh, the issues in international environmental law and, and issues in international law more generally. Um, it's a pleasure to have uh, the book in print um, and also to have, have this launch um, with my co-authors and with um, such a wonderful group of international lawyers um, uh, discussing uh, the book. So as Meg uh, stated at the beginning and as uh, the speakers have also mentioned, the book aims to provide um, an overview of uh, and discussion of the various different areas of international environmental law, and um, also to, uh, to cover the main instruments on, on each topic. And it aims to be a useful uh, resource for students, uh, practitioners, and policymakers. So, uh, and I'm uh, delighted, as uh, Meg mentioned, uh, that Attila has um, uh, adopted the book for, for his course. Um, and the, in the course of the book, we discuss um, many of uh, the, the sort of difficult policy areas and, and legal areas um, that exist in international environmental law. I think one of the main challenges uh, that we found when producing um, a book like this uh, in, is trying to fit the, uh, the vast amount of material that there is in international environmental law, both in terms of legal instruments, um, in terms of uh, soft law instruments, case law, and also um, the, the academic uh, commentary on, on these areas of law into what is, a, I hope you'll agree, a reasonably sized volume. Um, and um, the, part of the difficulty is that international law involves this, uh, this interplay between, uh, between treaties, between soft law, and also general principles as well as operating in a, a technical uh, policy environment. Um, uh, the speakers have addressed um, many of these issues. Um, and so I, I will just briefly uh, summarize or reflect on, uh, on what they have said. Um, Nilifer has focused on the protection of the marine environment and it highlighted the really fundamental role that uh, part 12 of UNCLOS uh, 
has played in the development of international environment, event, environmental law and still plays um, in the protection of the marine environment uh, 40 years on. Um, it has simple but broad and, and powerful obligations um, and is also uh, quite comprehensive in, in some of it, uh, the measures that it, that it, uh, that it has. Um, but Nilov has also highlighted the fact that 40 years on um, from 1982 to, to the present, there have been changes in other areas of international environmental law and changes in some of the issues that, um, that international environmental law has to address. In particular, of course, uh, climate change. Um, and Nilova has uh, pointed out uh, that there are gaps in the law of the sea regime, which uh, are in need of and are currently uh, being addressed or attempting to be addressed in terms of uh, the high seas and also in terms of ocean warming, acidification and sea level rise, which of course the ILC is, uh, is in the process of working on, as, uh, as Nilova is, uh, is well aware. Um, and so, and I think this reflects the fact that international environmental law is, some, is a field that is constantly responding uh, to new developments and constantly responding to, to new developments in various different ways through, uh, through lawmaking processes such as uh, the work of the ILC and other kinds of lawmaking processes such as interstate negotiations. Um, and, um, and these developments uh, work uh, in parallel, but also, uh, but also uh, interact with each other. Uh, to to address gaps um, that ha that have appeared over time. Uh, Maria Teresa, um, in her presentation, has uh, covered many areas of the substantive parts of the book, which I don't wish to uh, to cover. Um, but uh, what struck me was uh, the way in which Maria Teresa really highlighted the complex interplay between uh, domestic law, international law, and also uh, the supplementary role of soft law. Um, in, in developing uh, what we what we know of as international environmental law, um, as well as of course uh, the the complex interplay between general international law and also regional international law um, in the environmental law field, and then of course finally Maria Teresa touched upon the fact that uh, international environmental law doesn't sit in isolation from the rest of international law; it interacts with various other regimes of international law. Um, as we discussed in the book, uh, in particular trade law, and as Attila mentioned, also uh, increasingly international investment law, which, as he says, perhaps might be covered in a in a second edition. Um, but of course, in Maria Teresa's discussion of implementation, I think what stood out to me was the, uh, the way in which she highlighted the interplay uh, between uh, the, the principles of international law and, and the substantive norms. Um, when it comes to, to implementation, um, as well as the interplay between uh, the scientific and economic factors involved in implementation and uh, the legal rules and the legal solutions that have to be adopted by states when implementing um, international environmental agreements. Uh, moreover, uh, Maria Teresa highlighted the fact that uh, compliance isn't simply about the incorporation of international law into domestic law, but also involves uh, this very interesting role of international law in, in terms of its influence and its internalize, internalization by domestic actors. And I think that's a very important aspect of, uh, of inter international law within the environmental field. Um, I, 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 could, I could go on about, uh, um, uh, about this, but I just also want to highlight uh, one last aspect, which is the role of, of international courts and also domestic courts um, in the developing environmental law through the interpretation of, um, of its rules. Um, environmental law, of course, uh, involves, uh, involves the creation of a large number of compliance mechanisms that are concerned with in part anticipating problems uh, before they arise. But international courts uh, provide an opportunity for um, authoritative statements on the law that contribute uh, to its development. And um, I, I wish to come back to that briefly at the end. Um, Attila, in, in his uh, presentation, um, which again uh, covered many detailed areas of, of international, in particular international water law, um, also spoke more generally about the, uh, the complexities in thinking about environmental law 
um, when it comes to its relation with general international law. In particular, um, how international environmental law has been fundamental in, ch in changing some of the ways in which we think about general principles and um, the ways in which we, we might think about uh, general principles in the more technical ways that they might operate. Um, Attila also highlighted the fact that there's been a recent um, integration between international environmental law and, and human rights, and um, increasing thought given to the, the role of, um, of individuals and, and human welfare um, in, in terms of uh, uh, an environmental welfare in terms of human rights regimes. Um, this is obviously particularly relevant in the field of water law, which, as Attila says, is, is fundamental to human survival um, and, and also places, uh, uh, reflects a, a serious uh, sort of a main feature of international environmental law, which is the non-territorial character of watercourses and many of the issues in international environmental law, which tends to conflict with the traditional um, uh, char state-centric character and territorial character of international law. Um, I also want to briefly mention it, it, the, the point made towards the end of, uh, of Attila's talk about um, the role of uh, the, the developments of international environmental law in terms of uh, widening participation beyond the state and taking account of, uh, of a wider range of interests. Uh, and in particular, the role of non-governmental organizations in the development and codification of the rules of international environmental law. Insofar as um, international environmental law uh, brings together, and, and one sees it at, at the, the COPs for uh, the, in the climate change COPs, um, a vast number of actors um, who, who together um, contribute to the development of this uh, uh, this field of law. Um, I just want to, to end by saying by mentioning um, something that was mentioned by Nilifer and and also mentioned by uh, the other speakers as well, which is of course. Um, that international environmental law is at a very exciting moment, in particular in, um, in terms of the recent uh, advisor opinion before ITLOS. And of course, this, this is a development that has come out since the book came out, but it, there is an increasing judicialization, in particular in the field of climate change, um, that will send international environmental law in potentially new and interesting directions in terms of international litigation, um, and of course, uh, the, the advisory opinion before it lost represents a very significant uh, recent development. Um, and so, of course, the book, I hope, provides a, a good solid um, overview of the, the various areas um, in international environmental law. But I think, as Malgozi will, will talk about, uh, there are constantly new developments um, and developments in new and interesting directions uh, to take account of um, in this field. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, Joseph, for your response to our um, our discussions. And Melgosha, if you want to say a few words and thank you, thank you very much, Meg, for giving me the floor now and. I will start also thanking my co-authors. It is very nice to work with two colleagues who have the same approach as I have to environmental law. So it was very fruitful and very pleasant cooperation. And thank you very much for um, doing this journey with me together to finish the book. And also thank very much a very distinguished discussions for raising the subjects which are also very close to my heart, like compliance, maritime uh, protection, and water courses. And obviously, the, the presentations of the uh, panelists show very clearly that there is no and international environmental law without international law, and there is no international law these days without international environmental law. It is really a mutually supportive and very uh, mutually dependent to areas of international law. 
And I would like also to say that I think our sort of premise on which the book was based was to give a very solid platform by this book, in this book for further studying, to really uh, arise the interest for instance, of students to, uh, uh, to uh, delve deeply in the problems of international environmental law. So it was sort of a platform for further studying and for further observance of evolution of international environmental law. And in the context of this, I would like to mention that international environmental law is a very robust, resilient, and evolving area, probably uh, the most robust and resilient of all the areas of international law. And this is already, of course, I am pitching for the second edition of our book, because since we published our book, they were quite a lot of new developments, especially in the area of, um, of uh, international human rights law and international environmental law. So first of all, I would like to um, mention the resolution of, on 20, of 28th July, 2022, by the General Assembly, which granted a universal light uh, to clean environment, which is uh, firmly positioned within the uh, doctrine of intergenerational equity and sustainable development. And this is also something which I would like to stress that the, doc that the concept of intergenerational equity, which was conceived by Professor Brown uh, Weiss on the basis of the philosophy of John Rawls uh, of uh, generational justice has become a very much also a living area of international law, not only area of philosophy. And they are in many countries ombudsmen for future generations who are parts of the government and they have locus standi to bring the case before the court on the basis of the rights of future generations. And there are also many judgments of national courts and international courts where the interests of future generations um, are taken into account. So this is one, I think, major development uh, in the, um, at the global uh, area, the granting of universal right to a clean environment. Obviously, in the context of this, I would like to say that especially in Latin um, uh, America, the um, human the, uh, synergy between human rights and clean environment has been um, long acknowledged. And again, I would like to mention also the very um, influential advisory opinion of the Inter-American Court on Human Rights on the interrelationship between human rights and clean environment. Finally, I would like to mention the latest development, which was, which dates on 19 December 2022, so just a few months ago, uh, which was a resolution adopted by the Conference of the Parties of the Convention on Biological Diversity, which adopted so-called Canving Montreal Global Diversity Framework, in which it uh, uh, expressly mentions the uh, um, rights of nature and the rights of Mother Earth. And I think this is absolutely incredible step forward um, obviously, it raises all sorts of very interesting legal problems like locus standi, who can represent mother nature before courts, 
And this problem is already well known in Latin America again, and also New Zealand, where um, in Ecuador, it's um, the mother nature is granted a constitutional right. Uh, it's um, called uh, nature of Pachamama in the constitution of Ecuador. And also in Colombia, some rivers are granted rights or personhood in, in national law, which also raises the uh, issue of local standby of the uh, trustees of the rights of the river, of rivers. In relation to this, I also would like to mention a very important role, if not of paramount importance of indigenous peoples. And this is something which cannot be also uh, looked separately from development of international environmental law. And in the context of this, of the granting rights to nature and mother earth, it is of paramount uh, importance to look into philosophy and spirit spiritualities of indigenous peoples in the world. So um, in New Zealand, uh, two members of Maori indigenous peoples group are also trustees of the river, which was granted personhood. So as we can see, international environmental law, it's part of a very global nexus of international law, human rights law, a law of state responsibility, liability, and indigenous people's rights. But also, I would like to stress a very strong link with philosophy. Uh, which makes it very, very interesting. So philosophy of John Rawls, philosophy of Professor Brown Weiss, but also philosophy underlying beliefs of indigenous peoples. So um, I think that this is, that's why it is so uh, absolutely fascinating that it brings together all threads of international law philosophy and goes deeper and makes it richer when we look at particular area of law and philosophy. So environmental law is, I think, a very uh, interesting area of study for theorists as well and practitioners. And um, as Professor Tansi also mentioned, uh, more areas should be included because it's everywhere. So I would like to conclude saying that we cannot really study uh, various areas of international law, human rights law and philosophy with and indigenous rights law without looking at environmental law, how it all influences together and brings more areas of research and reflections. Thank you very much. I am acutely aware of the time and I um, apologize everyone for running over slightly. I'm <laughs> sorry to hold you um, from your day. Let me just thank everyone, our audience for joining us from all the different regions and time zones. Um, thank you for joining our conversation. Thank you to our discussants, Nilifer, Marie Teresa, Attila, thank you, Melgosha, thank you, Joe. It's really, you know, it's really um, such a pleasure to speak with all of you today on international environmental law. And thank you once again for all the wonderful things that you said about our our Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. You. Have a nice day, a nice <laughs> evening. Bye everyone. Bye.